Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another conversation. This week, I've got uh, Topher Field. We're going to have a bit of a slow chat about all things freedom <laughs> movement and the path path going forward. Topher is a uh, filmmaker and commentator on politics, mm. and he's been very influential in speaking over the last few years about faith, where we get our values, how to move forward. He even ran as a political candidate for the Liberal Democrats in Victoria, uh, in sorry, Tasmania for the, for the yep. Senate, and he did very, very well. And uh, I want to welcome you to the show, Topher, please. Mate, thank you very much. You know, it's, 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 it's this weird thing. I feel like I know you really well. Um, but actually we've chatted on the phone a couple of times. You've interviewed me once before. I think maybe we did like a, an Instagram live or something. We did. Yeah. Maybe back in, back in point. January or February. Like, yeah. Like back in the day. Um, but I actually feel like I know you really well. We've never been in the same room at the same time. So yeah. I just want to say well played, yeah. well played. Yeah. You've avoided me so far, but your luck is going to run out someday. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it's going to run out on the 23rd of August. So That's true. Um, if you guys haven't That's heard true. yet, um, I'll be down in uh, Melbourne on the 23rd. I'll be watching the uh, premiere screening of Battleground Melbourne, and I can't yeah. wait to have a look at that. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to finally meeting you in person. But um, look, it's, it's going to be good. But that room's going to be an amazing room to be in. The, the premiere for me is just kind of like a big, warm hug for everybody. Mm. Yeah, um, it's you know, there's other cinema screenings that are designed for you to bring other people along. There are some mm. people you send them the link online, they're not going to watch it. You bring the DVD, they're not going to watch it. But yeah. you say, hey, listen, it's in the cinemas. I've got you a ticket. Well, then they're obliged. Mm. They're going to come along. They're going to watch it. So that's what the idea is with all the other showings. But that premiere showing, it's like, let's just have a big warm hug mm. between all of us. Watch it celebrate together cry together i guarantee you there's going to be a lot of a lot of tears on the night uh it's just the nature of, of the doco and the nature of what we've all been through um so it's, it's going to be really interesting joel actually to get your perspective as someone who wasn't here at the time you didn't live through those events in the way that most uh people who'll be there did and actually your perspective is going to be quite an interesting one so i look forward to talking with you after that yeah absolutely i think we did the last time we interviewed uh, i actually did end up watching it and then we had a chat but yeah. um, but no, it was an absolutely amazing thing. I literally watched it the three hours before our interview, and <laughs> um, yeah, I def I you know, I teared up quite a few times because I remember seeing the whole thing take place, um, and uh, yeah. It's a beautiful state and I hate to see it. But no, we haven't met in person. It's going to be awesome catching up on the 23rd of August. And sure. uh, guys, just a side note, I want to make sure you guys get this at the start. If you want tickets to that, there's a bunch of different shows that that's being screened. Go to www.toferfield.net and you can get your tickets there. And I'm really excited to actually um, really get it out there that this is an amazing um, film. I've already watched it. It was really good. There's some excellent people that in that that actually really yeah. added some depth to that. Uh, Voice for Victoria is in there. Uh, Millie Fontana's in there. They did a really yeah. excellent job at mm -hmm. giving that depth of understanding in there. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, but um, without further ado, wow, uh, what's it been? Two, three months since the election? You had an awesome showing in Tasmania, you almost s snagged a spot, um, and a, and a, a lot of people are like oh, I don't think so. I think it was you actually be, quite close. You be, you look, you're being a little bit kind. Um, look, the reality is, we did by far better than the Liberal Democratic Party have ever done before in Tassie. We had roughly tripled their primary vote, but in all honesty, from a very low base. And I allowed myself to believe that the freedom movement as a whole was going to have a much stronger showing than what we did. I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We didn't have the showing that I genuinely believed that we would. I, I honestly thought that David Limbrick was going to get into the Senate here in Victoria. Uh, I, I thought surely after all that he's done, how could he not? Uh, and sure enough, he didn't. And, and in fact, it, it wasn't even really close in, in his particular case. And I just think that's very, it's very unjust. It's very unfair on him. I think he'd more than earned it. Um, but it also, I mean, it says things about where Australians are at as voters. It also says things about where we're at as a movement. And, and we have to be humble enough to, to go, okay, there's a reason why, for example, the legalized cannabis vote jumped up by five percentage points, or sorry, jumped up to over five percentage points. Uh, and, and many freedom parties only went sideways or improved by maybe a percentage point. Um, you know, there's, there's a reason why that happened and we need to really spend time drilling down and understanding what is that? What, you know, and, and what do we do differently going forwards? How do we stay absolutely true to our values, but also make ourselves more appealing and get more cut through when it comes to reaching out to voters who've never thought about us before? You know, we have to do both. We are a values based movement. We can't abandon our values. We're not going to abandon our values, but we need to find out how do we communicate these values better? 
so that we become a viable option in a lot more people's minds. So I gave it a red hot go. I had amazing support. The people of Tassie, phenomenal state. It always, I've always believed that. I've been there many times, both for business and for pleasure. But boy, they came out in, and some amazing people just came out of the woodwork and did amazing things uh, for me, uh, as well as for other candidates over there. A beautiful place. If you've never been to Tassie, do yourself a favor, get there, spend some time traveling around. Absolutely phenomenal. The people are incredible. The food, the quality of food in Tassie is next level. Oh. Now, I like my food. I don't know if you've noticed this about me. I, I, I like my food. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know. I haven't seen you in person. <laughs> the quality of the food in Tassie is genuinely next level. You go, you go whether it's up in Lonnie or, or down in Hobart or you know, in more sort of remote areas, you go into these unassuming looking places and you sit down, you order your food and it comes out and it's like you've gone to one of the, you know, one of the best restaurants in Melbourne. It, it, it's just, and that's just everywhere. It's just the food culture there. Really, yeah. really phenomenal place. So in terms yeah. of the election, I, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I think the federal election helped us to build a little bit of a base. We've got more volunteers in the Liberal Democratic Party than we've ever had before. Mm. Uh, we've got some amazing high caliber candidates coming uh, coming through for us now. Uh, and we're gearing up for the Victorian election um, and and putting all those lessons that we've learned into practice. Yeah, absolutely. When, when we had our discussion in January or February this year, I, I was taken aback by your knowledge of the preferencing system. And I think this was before your marbles video. And Probably, yeah. um, I was really, a lot of people that don't understand the system and it was just really refreshing to be like, yeah, this guy gets it. This guy gets mm. it. There, there's, mm. there are often deals made that he understands how, how to negotiate certain mm. certain deals and how it's actually done politically and um and how it actually works i mean i'm always still surprised by how much people don't understand how it works but um yeah for the federal election i was um i was basically right on the mark with where how the election was going to go and it was scarily yeah. accurate with the um uh post election analysis that was one thing but before mm. the election i was sort of ringing the bell 2 weeks out from the election saying guys ding 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 we're not reaching mainstream Australians, as you said, yeah. enough. Yeah. And yeah. I felt, and I, and I said, predicted that we'd prob the maximum we could get was six freedom centers. That was the maximum we could get. Now people were saying, "Oh no, we're going to form government," or "This guy's going to be our new prime minister," or whatever. Oh, yeah, I was yeah. like, "Guys, yeah. that guys, was, that like, was always a bit much." Yeah, and the problem was, and and I did this in a post after the election. I said, "Take note of who's explaining this to you." There were a lot of people mm. that oversold it, and I had mm. to. I felt like I had to tell it. A relative that another relative have, had died you know I, I, had to, I had to bring people back to earth and say all right mm. look this is what happened this is why it happened because the problem is when they set expectations that high Correct. if we don't if we don't get those expectations it must have been 100 percent voter fraud it must have oh, been like yeah. a north korea style 100 percent for you know the dictator and i was like guys no yes there are some major problems with the senate bad advice mm -hmm. was given out but with mm -hmm. with other stuff, it's 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 not a hundred percent rotten through and through. And no. you know, I took a lot of really good encouragement out of out of seeing what happened in Arizona in America, one mm. of those swing states that had one some of the worst voter fraud in the twenty twenty presidential election. Well, now all the Trump candidates have just swept it. That yeah. is like a hope story for Australia, and I'm trying to yeah. get that message out to people. Yeah, well, the, the interesting thing with the upcoming Victorian election, because that's obviously where my head is at now, is, is focused on trying to get the best possible result there, uh, which is why I just want everyone to watch Battleground Melbourne, because if every Victorian watched Battleground Melbourne, Daniel Andrews would lose for sure. Um, not that Matthew Guy's any better, but that's another story. Um, okay, we'll get to that. We will get to yeah, we'll that. Get to that. The, the thing with, the, thing with um, the Victorian system, there's two key differences. Number one, at a federal level, the AEC, the Australian Electoral Commission, the guys that look after federal elections, I genuinely believe that there is no systemic corruption, right? Now, systemic corruption, as distinct from, are there some opportunistic individuals within the system who might use their position to advantage their team in some way? I can't rule that out. But I'm quite convinced that there is no systemic corruption in the AEC. I'm not yet willing to say the same thing about the VEC, right? The, right. the bureaucracies in Victoria have been politicized over a long period of time to a degree that is quite scary. We saw that with yeah. you know, Victoria Police obedience to a lot of the draconian laws that were passed, or rules, they're not even laws, the rules that were passed during lockdowns, et cetera. We've seen that in the way that IBAC and other anti-corruption bodies keep on coming out with these reports that say, oh, here's all this corruption. It's clear and crystal. And then the conclusion of the report is we don't believe there's enough evidence to, to prosecute, which now just kneecaps any future prosecution because any anyone any future prosecution, they, the, the defense just brings that to the judge and says, hey, 
the anti-corruption bodies looked at it and said there wasn't enough evidence. Don't waste the court's time. Yeah. So what they've done is they've laid everything out and then completely kneecapped anyone that's trying to hold you know, Daniel Andrews or others accountable. Uh, we see that there is a huge amount of genuine corruption, I believe, in uh, the Victorian public service and within Victorian politics. So I'm, I'm not saying that the VEC is corrupt. I'm just saying I'm not yet willing to take the stand because there's a lot of people that get grumpy at me when I say, no, there's no corruption. There's no systemic corruption in the AEC. People yeah. get grumpy at me. They want there to be corruption in the AAC. They want yeah. to believe that that was the only reason that we lost uh, or didn't win the last election. We were never going to form government. Uh, you know, you, you won't find me claiming that we were going to form government. We weren't. It's ob It was obvious. I was optimistic. I thought that we could get our six senators. I thought we could get one from each state. I did allow myself to believe that we were going to do better than we did. Guilty as charged. But I never said we're going to form government. I said we might get somewhere between three and five lower house seats and if we're lucky, we'll get you know the full six senators, and that's about our peak. That's about as good as it's mm. going to get. We we got nowhere near that. So, mm. in the Victorian election, the, the the two main differences are number one, I have some concerns about the way the election is going to get run. Uh, there is some there is some scope there, in my opinion, for things to be done underhandedly. Now I know there are people working on that. There are people working on making sure it doesn't happen, and there are other people that are working on things to try and ensure that if anything does happen, it will become visible. It won't be able to be kept secret. Uh, so we'll see how that go. But the other big difference with Victoria is that we still have the group voting tickets. So my marbles video does not apply to the Victorian election. It works entirely differently. Yeah. And in fact, I probably need to take the marbles videos down and release a <laughs> Victoria specific one. Yeah. Uh, because otherwise people are going to watch that marbles video and think that that's how it works at all elections yeah. within Australia. No, that's how it works at the Australian federal election. Yeah. Uh, so we have group voting tickets. Deals are going to be done between political parties. Some political parties will publish what those deals are. Others won't. Mm. Um, it's all going to get a little bit messy, but myself and many others, and I'm sure you'll be you'll be helping out to, to, to amplify our message, um, Joel, we, we will be trying to put out really good quality information around that between now and the election so that people understand what's going on. Yeah. Uh, to say that, look, I don't know if there's systemic uh, corruption or malfeasance happening in the VEC, but I can 100% say that they are the worst in the country. Um, I, I talked I, I, to... In my opinion, I agree with that. I, I, I talked to a number of politicians, both when I was in Victoria in November last year when, when they opened the borders between New South Wales and Victoria. And I was also just recently there for a few days um, in Victoria doing some groundwork, doing some recon, Trying to, yep. trying to ascertain, because you can't do this when you're in a different state, guys, a thousand Ks away. You've got to be there on the ground talking to people face to face. There are some things people will not say over the phone. They need to see the whites of your eyes. And so I got down there mm -hmm. and, mate, I, I, I'm pretty much, we're, we're coming up to the 100 days out from the election. I pretty much know how this election is going to go. And mm. I, I'm, I'm not really happy with what I'm seeing. Um, to, to paint a stark picture, there are at least 13 freedom parties running in this particular election. What's a freedom party? One that, that believes against lockdowns, mandates, you know, passports yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, these 13 freedom parties, if you thought it was bad federally in terms of they don't want to work together, mm -hmm. the, the, on a state level, they do not want to work together. I mean, they're forming little clusters. So two here will be together. These three will sort of work together. In preference. And this is the thing, guys, as Topher alluded to before, in the preferencing is different. One of the biggest differences is you don't have to number all the boxes mm. for for the how to vote card. So the problem we've got is, you know, they may not preference each other, the thirteen freedom parties. You know, and, I, and that and that's a thing. Joel, let me let me say this. I think there's gonna be a couple of outliers that will just dig in and refuse to to negotiate. But when you actually any any mature political party, now unfortunately there's a lot of new ones. Uh, but any mature political party that has been through at least one electoral cycle before mm. clearly understands that there is no downside to making preference deals because by the time you are distributing your preferences, you've already been eliminated, right? There is no, it does not hurt you mm. to make those deals. Now, obviously they're going to make those deals in the way that they think advantages them the most, mm. right? So each of them is going to be argy barging and trying to get the best possible deal. Um, but for a party to turn around and not do a deal with one of the other freedom parties and then just to, you know, to, to bump up the major parties higher on their card mm -hmm. is incredibly immature, is incredibly short-sighted. So I, I hope that none of them fall for that trap. They may. I hope that none of them do. Um, in some, there is an argument to be made, Joel, that the group voting tickets actually help 
these minor parties in these situations. And let me put the argument to you, and I'm not sure where I stand on this, but sure. let me put the argument to you. One of the things that we saw with the federal election where people did get to choose where they wanted to put their own vote, it was just all entirely on their own numbering. Uh, there were no group voting tickets where the parties decided where they went. What we saw was only about 20% of people actually followed the how to vote cards and about 80% voted number one for, in my case, Liberal Democrats and then voted number two for the Liberal Party or voted number one for a, a UAP and then voted number two for, for the Liberal Party. It's like, well, guys, you needed to you needed to vote number one for the, your party of your choice and then number two for the other guy and then number three for the other guy and don't put the majors until you know near yeah. the end, just in front of the Greens and, and in teals and things like that. But people didn't follow that advice. What happens with the group voting tickets is they just put a number one next to that party and then the party decides where the preferences go. And what we've actually seen is senators or, or upper house MPs being elected on sometimes less than a half a percent of the yeah. primary vote yeah. because all of the preferences are flowing as a block. So there is an argument to be made if all of the freedom friendly parties can put ego and everything else aside and actually just put each other in their group voting tickets that we've actually perhaps got a better chance than what we did in the federal election. Yeah, um, the, 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 alluding there to the um, little scheme that um, Glenn Drury is running down there, which I was very eager to hear about when I was there. Um, I do yep. believe some a, a number of people have done segments on this online. It's mm. uh, how does this work, guys? How does this work? And this is I'm not specifically talking about Glenn Drury. This is how it could work. Yeah, you get you get five five parties basically one two three four five. What they do is they basically cut up the state and they say, okay, you can run here in the upper house, you run here in the upper house, you run here in the upper house, you run here in the upper house, and they go around the circle and they say, okay, for this area, this guy's a part of our team, we're all going to put him as our number two preference. For this area, it's this person's turn. They're going to be the number two. And they go all the way around until everyone gets their seat, and that's how someone can get in on a very small margin. They all just sort of back that person in that area. Now, is it illegal? No, it's not illegal. Is it immoral? I think it's 100% immoral. You know, this this sort of thing, I don't think it would happen on a federal level. And, um, and you know, I, I think that, that people should be going to the election and putting their ideas forward. Now, Victoria is so far gone, you're going to have, there's going to be certain things that you guys, as a state, this is not my state, I'm, I've lived in New South Wales my whole life, you got to work out how you're going to save your state. Mm -hmm. You know, the best thing I can do is um, for this particular election is I'm putting some how to vote cards out under the Turning Point Australia brand, which is not me that does it. It's a separate team. And they will be heavily uh, getting input from Victorians that we know, like and trust, many of which I actually visited when I was in Victoria. And um, and those that that will help inform that. And hopefully we can turn right. the state around. I noticed you didn't me. You didn't visit me as part of that list of Victorians you know, like, and trust. I visited was, a lot. My I, visit. I visited a lot of people in Victoria, and unfortunately, I did try to meet with you, but we you didn't did make try it to work. meet me. Oh, yes, um, I, I wasn't able to make it work. And I've got but plenty. I've, I've got pl I've got plenty more meetings uh, to go in uh, in my next trip. I'll be there for a few days next time. But um, but but yeah. Um, look, it, it, Vic, Victoria. So, Drury, it, Glenn Drury is known as the preference whisperer um, mm. because of the work that he's done in the past, getting people elected on very small margins. Mm. Now, I'm, I'm with you in this sense. If I had my way, voting would not be compulsory uh, and you would have to number each person that you want your vote to go to. There would be no group tickets and there would be no rules around how many you have to number. You could number as few or as many as you want or you could just not show up. To me, that's what a free vote actually looks like. That's what a free and democratic system would actually look like. Mm. Um, however, that's not the system that we have. And so we have to kind of work within the system that we do have. Mm. And the system that we have has group voting tickets. So does it then become immoral to use the system that we have to try and get the best possible outcome? I'm going to, I'm going to come down on the other side of that to you, Joel, and say, no, it is the system that we have. I think as long as it's being acknowledged, as long as you're not, um, deceiving the public about what you're doing. I think at that point, it's it's all fair in love and war. And here's the clincher to that, in my opinion. If it were not for those sorts of games being played, we would not have had David Limbrick and Tim Quilty in, in the upper house in Victoria over the last couple of years, which means there would have been basically no one standing up against lockdowns, etc. The only reason we have them at all is because uh, these minor parties were willing to work together and play those games. So that's that would be my counterpoint.
Sure. Yeah. Look, and and look, I don't know. Uh, as I said, guys, I'm not sure about this. This is um, I, I I'm I'm glad I have the privilege to actually not go and say, um, you know, this is how it must be done. I, it's not my state. Um, but what we are doing, <clears throat> excuse me, what we are doing is our own how to vote card so that we go above that and we're like, <clears throat> this is how we want to do it. These are the candidates we like. And, uh, and I think this is the best way forward. But um, to say that, you know, I've been taking a lot of, ever since I did visit Victoria recently, I've been trying to work out wh- where the chips are going to land. And so yeah. from, from what I can see, and this is only, you know, we're still over 100 days out from the election, guys, three months. From what I can see, where I see this election going right now is I see a, a Dan Andrews win in the lower house. I see him winning in his own right with a majority. And in the upper house, I see him getting, um, being able to still get legislation passed, but with a very large crossbench um, who will allow it to pass just like with the permanent pandemic bill. That's the truth. That's what I see. Now, why? Is it because I'm trying to demoralize you guys? No, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be 100% realistic. You've got three months to turn this ship around. And, I, mm-hmm. and this is the thing. If you lose this, you're coming to, you're coming, a lot of you are going to come to New South Wales. <clears throat> um, 200,000 people have left Victoria. Well, there you go. I thought, I thought you told me in our last conversation you weren't coming to New South Wales. No, so, so uh, we finished our tour. We drove up to Brizzy and back and had a look around. And um, on our way home from uh, Albury, the, on the last leg back into Melbourne, my wife turned to me and said, after November, so after the election, um, let's, let's leave Victoria. And I said, you mean if Daniel Andrews wins? She said, no, just we'll stay to the election. Cause I've promised that if, if I didn't win in Tassie, I was going to stay in, in Victoria long enough to vote against Daniel Andrews. So I'll do that. Right. Right. Uh, and she said, no, nope, doesn't matter. Let's just get out of Victoria. Let's just get a change of scenery. You know, she's been in, her family's been in Victoria for five generations. I've been in Victoria for all but the first two years of my life. We've never known, like we've traveled, but we've never lived. We've never settled. We've never yeah. made a life anywhere else. And and I think the time has come. I mean, for me, I just need to get out of Victoria for a while just because it doesn't feel like home anymore. I feel I feel like I'm now living as a visitor uh, in, in a foreign place. And I, I just need to get out and find where is home for me now. So, And, and I know that, that I won't be the only one. Let me make a, a, a contrary prediction just so that in the after-election coverage, one of us gets to point fingers at the other. <laughs> Here you go for it, mate. Um, for it. <laughs> what I see happening, in my view, is similar to what rolled Jeff Kennett. So Jeff Kennett won two elections. He was quite popular, had a very, very significant majority. But over the journey, he just pissed off a lot of people in little ways, Right. And approaching his third election, he was overwhelmingly considered the favorite. He was he was absolutely expected to win. Uh, and he ended up losing. And he lost not because there was this groundswell of people that hated him. And, you know, in the case of Daniel Andrews, he's not going to lose because there's a groundswell of people that have discovered freedom and they're voting for freedom parties. Yeah. It's going to be because people are just a bit tired of him. They're just a bit fatigued. Yeah. They're just a bit right. like, oh, right. you know what? I, I don't want to see him on my TV again. I saw him every freaking day for two years. I don't want him back on my team. I'm just a bit tired. And to to reinforce that argument, Daniel Andrews is nowhere to be seen right now. He is avoiding cameras. He's avoiding media. I think that his polling and the internal party polling is showing very clearly uh, that his face is not helping him right now. And and staying away from the media is actually the smart play. So I'm going to say that it's going to be fairly close, but I think that Daniel Andrews is, is likely to go down. Now, I'm going to caveat we still have to do the work, right? We still have to offer an actual alternative and put the argument out there. And if we don't, Daniel Andrews may very well win and we'll only have ourselves to blame. So I'm with you on that point. We have to do the work. But I do think that there's an opportunity here for us to ride a level of not, not a freedom movement, but a level of dissatisfaction, disillusionment, tiredness, fatigue that people have towards Daniel Andrews. And we can leverage that to get him thrown out. Yeah, but I think that's the biggest problem, and that's what I see. Um, it's not enough to put to to have a, you know an opponent that's the devil. You also need no. to put a, 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 an opposing vision forward. And I think that yeah. um, the, that Matthew guy and you, you, I mean, you're in furious agree- agreement with me. <laughs> is not that alternative vision. He is a weak no. liberal party leader that is not the opposition. He 
that guy, 50% climate target, I mean, more than the federal level uh, 43%. I mean, are you joking? Are you trying to lose? I think he's, yeah. I genuinely think he's trying to lose. I mean, does he have kids? Like, do they have his kids, like, and they're hiding him and, and they're holding a gun to their head? Like, what's, what's going on? No. This guy's trying to lose the election. No, he is, he is symptomatic of the rot inside the Liberal Party. So uh, I don't know if I told you the story last time we spoke. I don't tell it very often, so hopefully I haven't um, already. But I was invited in the first couple of years of me doing political commentary. I'd only made a few videos up to that point. I was invited by someone to speak at a Victorian Liberal Party branch meeting up in the Dandenongs. And uh, I said, look, thanks for the invitation, but I don't think you understand who you've invited. I'm not a Liberal Party guy, um, and you're not going to like what I have to say. And they replied to my email and they said, no, 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 you don't understand. I've got your measure. I'm going to like what you've got to say. It's everyone else in the room that isn't. All right. And I was like, oh, okay, all right. Well, I'm off the yeah. chain then. I'm, I'm just going to go for it. So right. what I did, they did all the formalities and they said, oh, we've got Topher. He's going to speak. I stood up mm. and I read the speech that Robert Menzies gave <laughs> when he founded the Liberal Party. Yeah. And he talks in that speech ex about exactly what the Liberal Party is for and exactly what the Liberal Party is against. Yeah. He lays them both out very clearly. And I finished reading that and I simply said, if you were to look at the policies of the Liberal Party today and you didn't know that that was the party that Robert Menzies founded, would you think it was the party that Robert Menzies founded or would you think it was the party that Robert Menzies was warning us against? Mm. And then I sat down. Not very many people spoke to me afterwards. I'm not yeah. not sure why. I never got invited yeah. back. Weird, huh? I, I, I can't possibly <laughs> I imagine why. why. Yeah. Um, How dare so you? I've, I've not been a fan of the Liberal Party for a very, very long time, and they yeah. lost their values a very, very long time ago. Uh, yeah, we had Premier Jeff Kennett here in Victoria uh, in during the nineties, um, and and I think we'd already. I think the Liberal Party had already lost its values even then. It right. was only by the strength of will of Jeff Kennett that they still held on to some level of their values. And right. as soon as he got rolled, um, that was it. The, the party was then completely set adrift. There was no anchor holding them in place at all. And, and this is where they've ended up. Right. See, that's the first problem, a vision to strive towards. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm saying all of this, guys, because you can actually still turn this around. There yeah. is a window of opportunity right now to get rid of this leader and for the Liberals to take stock of what's you going on. You may not on. know because yeah. you're not in Victoria. Um, Matthew Guy just had an absolute train wreck of an interview yeah. on 2GB. Recently. I saw. Okay, you yeah, know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Voice um, for Victoria has been covering it very well. Okay, yeah, good. good. I, wasn't, I wasn't aware they'd been covering it. That's great. Um, so to me, there's an opportunity here where, where maybe, maybe the membership are going to realise that the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. But honestly, if they're going to change leaders, they've got maybe two weeks to do it because if they wait another month, yep. it's too close to the election. Yeah. Even now it's too close to the election, but they could get away with it. 100% now is the time. Like, And this is the thing. A lot of people don't know this, but in the Liberal Party, now is the time too. We just saw uh, Matt Keane. He's now been uh, elected as the deputy leader deputy, of the New and South the, Wales uh, Premier. Yep. Uh, of the Liberal Party in New South Wales. And um, well, actually, no, he was the deputy pre pre premier. Uh, sorry, he's... He was the deputy premier, but now he's the deputy leader of the Liberal Party. It used to be Stuart Ayres. Um, but anyway, right. the, the point the point being, the numbers, people are getting unsettled about a lot of this, uh, mm. what, what's going on in New South Wales. It seems like they're holding on all this dirt is just getting released right now um, mm. about the Barilaro affair and his job mm. that he was offered in New York and all that crap. You know, just corruption, mm. guys. You don't need, forget about the minutia. Politicians are bad, okay? And, and it's no surprises to you. I'm sure you understand. But there is a window of opportunity for New South Wales six months out from the election to actually make mm -hmm. a difference. If they want to lose, they should make Matt Keane the premier and they should take it to the election and try to be Labor light or the Teals or whatever, and they'll lose. You and, can't um, outgreen the Greens. Can't. You can't. And so, look, that's the first problem. The first problem is a vision of strive forwards. We don't see. Mm -hmm. And the other problem is I'm looking at these freedom parties and I'm seeing – over 13 freedom parties that do not want to preference each other. And the way that the preference system has worked in Victoria, even in other countries, if, if, you're not, if it's not mandatory to preference all the, all the numbers, then what's going to end up happening is they won't preference each other. And then the Labor Party, the Liberal Party will come up the center and just end up having the highest vote in the actual areas. Yeah. Um, and to make matters worse, uh, a lot of the... Um, people in New South Wales and a lot of people in the federal election around the country, they, we had one of the highest not voting rates in history. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. th th 
if you've actually got to get people to to mark the ballot as well. And so I I just put those just those things combined. I'm like, oh guys, this is this is an absolute disaster. And you might tell me to sod off, guys, and that's fine, <laughs> but prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Turn your state around. I would love to have a lot of you come up to New South Wales if it goes for the worst. But I think New S- Victoria, we can't have the whole of Victoria annexed to the Chinese Communist Party because of the Belt and Road Initiative. All right. I know we sort of dealt with that in the past, but that's where things are going. We, we need you guys to, to, to smash this. It's going, you're heading for a train wreck, an iceberg, dead ahead. You can do this. Yeah. Look, it's, it, it is pretty grim. Let me let me again uh, make a counterpoint. Not that I'm, I'm I didn't come here just to disagree with you the whole time, Joel. But you know, <laughs> no, it's it's out, healthy. That's what, that's what I'm doing. I didn't invite you on to just agree, so <laughs> that's good. Good, good. Uh, you know me well. Um, you know, th- there does come a point where your loyalty to your family has to take precedence over your loyalty to the state, or even to to your your sort of your ideology, your your beliefs in you know in that political sense of your beliefs. Um, you know, I tell the story often about when I was in Venezuela and I, I was talking to the old guy in a jazz bar uh, in, the, in the city of Caracas, run down, absolutely, like it may as well have been a war zone. It was the most dangerous place on earth outside of a war zone at the time. I was there with my wife for a friend's wedding and we're there and, and he's this old guy and, and he quickly sort of figured out where I was coming from politically and he just sort of almost, it was like a, he'd been waiting to pour his heart out to someone and he poured his heart out to me. And he had enough English. He told me about how he did everything that he could to stop the socialists from winning to mm. stop um, Hugo Chavez mm. from winning. He supported the opposing political parties. He attended rallies. He, you know, did all the various things, letterboxing, all the rest of it. Um, and it wasn't enough. And Hugo Chavez won. And he mm. says, the one thing that I didn't do, and he had good enough English that he actually used this idiom. He says, I didn't make a plan B for if we lost. Right? Mm. And so he was sitting there and he had tears in his eyes as he was saying to me that other people that were part of that movement had then gotten out of Venezuela because they saw the writing on the wall. Mm. They understood what it meant. And they were living happily in Spain or in the US or in you know other parts of South America or you know Colombia being a big one. Um, but he was stuck in Venezuela and his son had basically lost his business and lost hope and lost everything. And his grandson was suffering the effects of malnutrition. Mm. Uh, because they were stuck in Venezuela. And I made a vow that day, that night, literally right there as I was looking at his face, I made a vow, I will never be that guy. I will never be that guy that saw it coming, fought tooth and nail to stop it, but didn't make a plan B for the sake of my own family. So there is a point, I think, where it becomes acceptable to abandon ship, but I don't believe we've reached that point. Um, and, and I'm going to be fighting tooth and nail all the way into this election because I do believe it's winnable. I do believe that there is a certain cultural fatigue with Daniel Andrews that's working in our favor and we can leverage that, uh, and we can get, uh, we can get him thrown out. And from there, we're still in with a fighting chance. We can, we can turn the ship around from there. If yeah. the Victorian people do return Daniel Andrews back into power, it says very, very frightening things about us. Uh, and at that point, that would be when personally I'll be going, okay, I'm going to prioritize my family. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you can turn this around, which is why I mate one of the, one of the, uh, I think I might've told you, we're having the exact same discussion we had six months, six, seven months ago. Are we? <laughs> yeah, we are. I just realized it just occurred to me because you, you told that story last time. I've got to apologize. I tell no. the Venezuelan story a lot, but honestly, it was one of those really defining moments of my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, and and and, and I'm moment. I'm about to hit you with an equally defining moment. That's why it, I'm. Yeah, it's, it's it's funny how what's wrong with us. Uh, <laughs> so I, I remember last time I was talking about Peter Hitchens and and mm. how he sat down with an interview with John Anderson, former Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he basically said, "Nope, it's over. There's no there's no sense in hoping. It's 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 done." And I reckon I didn't sleep for almost two weeks. I, I was yeah. just like, it, it, it was one of the biggest activators for me. Yeah. This was in uh, late, early 2019, I think it was, late okay. 2018. So and before um, the world went completely mad. Pretty, yeah, pretty much. Because, because this is the, and this is the thing, you were making videos before it was cool in 2020 to do it. You know, you were, you were, you were seeing what was going with the social moorings. You were seeing the collapse of Rome. You were seeing the fact that we've lost our Judeo Christian values. They've, mm. They've intercepted the universities, the schools, they're indoctrinating the kids, you know, this long march to the institutions, which is indoctrinating us, climate change, 
all of this stuff that's going on, the, the massive corporations overseas, the problem with overspending, you were talking about all of this before it was cool to do it. Now, yeah. Peter Hitchens was talking on a lot of these points as well in this particular mm. interview. And mm. that was the interview that just did it for me. I was like, we really are stuffed. Like, yeah. and, and I had two, I was just shocked for two weeks. I was just like, mm. What are we going to do? And, you know, if that doesn't activate you, I don't know what does. So when I saw that, I was like, that's it. You know, you know what? Like, I know I might be young and naive, but um, I, I think I think we could make a difference. And so, you know, I, I sort of got a bit more in, engaged in politics and, you know, we are where we are now. But um, but well, no. Here's, uh, my, here's yeah. my position. I've, you're absolutely right. I've been I've been commentating politically since 2009. I've been warning about the consequences of overspending and debt since 2012. Uh, over regulation, um, you know, the, the the Ministry of Truth, the government defining what's true, etc. Since two thousand fifteen, um, all that stuff, all the way through, I was I was um, opposed to big government before it was cool. Um, but the there's two things that we need to do. We need to fight tooth and nail, but we also need to look to our own families and to our own situations because there is power in opting out of the system. There is power in a large enough number of people not being dependent on the food supply chain, the power grid, the, you know, the, the mainstream media, et cetera. There, there is power in that. And so my decision, as I, as I was look, at the start of 2020 and I was weighing my options, I was thinking, is this my fight? Do I really want to get wrapped up in this? Because I could see where it was going. And I think I said this in our last interview as well. I'm going to say it again. I told my wife when she was, when I, when I proposed to her, I said, listen, I genuinely expect I'm going to go to prison someday. Okay. Right. That's a, that's a genuine expectation of mine. And yeah. I'd said that to my mum previously. She brought it up on my wedding day as part of her speech. Um, you know, this is it. You, you don't get into political commentary naively, or at least you shouldn't. You should be looking at the way things are going. And, and I understand that being someone who is willing to speak out against the popular narrative is going to become increasingly criminalized unless we can turn this around. And that means I'm going to end up in prison at some point in time. And I nearly did already in, in, in you know, last year when I got arrested, um, but thankfully was spared any prison time. I'm still up on those charges. It hasn't been resolved yet. Yeah. Um, but, and so I, I'm at the start of 2020 and I'm like, well, this could be it. This could be the big fight. And this could be the one that puts me in prison. <clears throat> Am I willing to actually follow through on this? Am I willing to actually do this? Because the chance of me making a difference is slim to none. Mm. I'm just some random nobody YouTuber, um, you know, and me speaking out. Okay, yeah, I've got the likes of Professor Johnny Ioannidis with his data, you know, backing me up. I've, I've, I've got the data to talk about this. Mm. But at the end of the day, I'm a nobody and I'm sticking my neck out to make probably no difference. And I made the decision I was going to do it anyway. And, and here's my rationale. My objective was not to win because I can't control that. It's a much bigger problem than, than you know, me stepping in is not going to turn the tide on its own. I made the decision I was going to speak up regardless of whether I thought we were going to win because I want history to record that there were people who stood. It's as simple as that. Win, lose or draw, the history books, won't not, my name won't be written in them, but the fact that there were people like me and like you that did try and stand and that there was a resistance movement, the fact that that existed will be recorded in history. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's an important enough thing to achieve that I'm willing to take the risks and, and pay the, the price to achieve that. Um, and I've done that for the last two years and, and I think I've earned my stripes in that regard. And so my head is very much turning now to my own family and to our, our individual circumstances. Not that I'm going to stop what I'm doing, but the time has come for me now. Obviously, I'll go hammer and uh, hammer and tong all the way into this election, and then I'm going to enter a phase of my life where it's it's actually about my family. All right. Um, yeah. I um, the only question left in my mind is, um, I'm throwing everything I can at this Victoria election within my power as well. But sure, uh, being so, someone from not from the state, like when I took on the Turning Point Australia brand, I didn't want it just to be Turning Point New South Wales. I was like, no, no, I care about every state and every territory, you know, um, and it's not turning point East Coast either. You know, I try, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I try, I try to help as much as possible in, in all the states. It's just, yeah. there's not, there's not many of us. We're a growing team. We've only been, a, I think we're coming up on a year in September, but, yeah. um, but yeah, my, the only question left in my mind is what, what happens if, if it does turn for the worst in Victoria, mm. in New South Wales, do the liberals say, you know what, this strategy of, being Labor light worked really well federally. Oh, we lost. Scott Morrison lost. It, 
Matthew Guy trying it in Victoria. Oh, no, nope, he lost. Maybe we should try it. Maybe we should make it a hat trick. Like, is that what they're really going to do? Like, or are they, you know what I mean? Because November, November 26th is the November, is the, the Victorian state Victorian election. election. Yeah. We've got our New South Wales election in March. That's still enough time if mm. they, if to work out what's going on. I mean, I'm hoping they change, make the changes now. But these sure. people are slow learners. They just had their state um, uh, council meeting in New South Wales, and um, yeah, that they were electing new members, and um, to, to to represent the the state of of the Liberal Party, and um, yeah, I'm just hoping they learn the lesson so that we do have a place for people to run back to. New South Wales is a big state; it's the most populous state. You know, I think, you know, we, we could be the home Texas for the country. We could be the start of something. We could be the Florida if we get the right premier in. Mm. All I'm going to say is you're better off living where the food is grown rather than where it's eaten. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. No, As we go true. forward, you're better off living where the food is grown than where it's eaten. Absolutely. Be at the start of that supply chain, not the end. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Nice and close. Um, but just to caveat, guys, New South Wales has the biggest police force, so just watch out for that. But we've got a lot of we've got a lot of Middle Easterners that look a lot like myself in southwestern Sydney. You know, a lot of legal guns, so the government will think twice before doing anything. So just just <laughs> just so you know. Um the the twelve LGAs of concern that Gladys Berejiklian locked down. You know, we did we did take out our premier in a in a roundabout way. Uh, yeah. I, ICAC yeah. got, got her. You know, we still have the rule of law in New South Wales, unlike Victoria, where IBAC yeah. is basically a toothless tiger. But um, but no, I um, yeah, I, I'm very excited to actually see how the next few months go. But look, I'm actually prepared to see at this stage, New South Wales, the Liberal Party, they're going to lose the next election as well. Yeah, but that's that's my opinion, and this is this is this is my state. This is my bread and butter. Yeah. The way things are going, the trajectory in New South Wales, we're going to lose as well. The freedom yeah. parties, I don't think they'll be able to get the balance of power in the upper house in New South Wales. It's within possibility, but um, we're, I, I'm already looking three years ahead to the next federal election. That's where my mind's at. I don't say this to demoralize people. I no, say this. No, no. To, to make sure that, hang on, guys, we've got a lot of work and a lot of mainstream Aussies that have no idea what's been happening. Yeah. Um, but uh, what, I, we've got is a, what we've got is a massive PR and marketing problem. It was mm. funny. My, my wife came to her first Friedman conference, which is the Australian Libertarian Society conference, some years ago, I think in the first couple of years of our marriage. And um, she, she was, she'd been there for about a half a day and she just came up to me quietly and she said, these... Guys, marketing is terrible. And of course, there wasn't there wasn't marketing per se going on, but she's just looking at the presentation, the the, the branding, the communication. I mean, it's just it's really unappealing. It is. It and this has been this has been our problem all the way through. Um, and people like myself, like yourself, like Voice for Victoria, like so many other amazing people that are trying to communicate with the wider public, we're gaining ground. You know, I'm slowly accumulating more people that are paying attention to what I do. You've grown massively. Uh, you know, Voice of Victoria and, and so many others have grown in, in, in really amazing ways. But it takes a lot of time. It takes an enormous amount of resources. I know you must have poured your heart and soul into what you do over the last year, Joel, to, to get to where you have. Um, you know, I've been chipping away steadily for, for 12 years and, and much more aggressively now for, for sort of two uh, to get to where I am. Um, and it, it just, it requires just an enormous amount of of effort sacrifice focus time and time's the worst one time's the biggest problem yeah. uh, because obviously time's not really working for us for as long as people keep voting the way that they that they currently are yeah. so in my opinion joel what we need is for people like you and emily and myself and and all of the others to be better resourced over the next couple of years to yeah. be able to actually make the difference to be able to actually just communicate this message yeah. Because I'm sorry, but you know, Clive Palmer has a messaging problem. Oh, yeah. uh, the Liberal Democrats have a messaging problem. We're working on that, but we have a messaging problem. Um, you know, all of these parties have a messaging problem, and no one's got it right yet. No one's hit that jackpot. You know, and and I didn't either in Tassie, right? I I, I did the best I could with what I had, what I know, gave the best messaging that I could come up with, and it wasn't right yet. It yeah. was it was decent. It had more cut through than we had in other states. Yeah. But it still isn't just that that magic kind of formula. 
Yeah. And so we need more people, more minds with more resources working on this problem and and not giving up. Let me be clear, even if I move out of Victoria or even if I move out of Australia, I'm not stopping. I'm not giving up. I'm just getting my family somewhere where I can keep doing what I do and they're not vulnerable. That's all I'm doing. I don't, I'm not going to stop fighting. Yeah, absolutely. And um, can I just slightly pivot for the audience? Yeah. You guys are probably listening and I'm talking to the audience right now. You guys are probably mm -hmm. listening and being like, oh my God. These guys think that, you know, we're going to go in this direction and it's all bad and terrible. Can I just take two seconds to just be like, hang on, it's not going to be all bad for a second. Let's reflect on some of the victories we'd had. Mm -hmm. And and this is something I said after the election. We successfully defunded the major parties millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. The Labor Party, what you see is they got in with a clear majority in the lower house. Okay. But what you didn't see is that their primary vote absolutely crashed. Topher Field talked about this before the election. For every vote you get, if you get at least 4% of the vote, you get $2.90 for every vote yep. in the lower house and the Senate, depending on where you get it. We defunded both major parties. So they both lost massively. And we funded the minor parties so they could fight the next elections really hard on. We had yep. more freedom candidates we've ever had. One Nation tried to run in every seat. The UAP tried to run in every seat. The Lib Dems ran in most seats. I mean, it was absolutely amazing seeing all 10 freedom parties battling it out and in most cases working together. On top of that, as you said, we created an entirely new freedom freedom uh, media, alternative mm -hmm. media class that's actually mm -hmm. become self-sufficient in the way that it's funded by the people. So what does that mm -hmm. mean? It means we don't get donors single donors that are corporations that actually control it and can pull the plug at any time. It is decentralized. That's amazing. And on and, top of that- and Can I comment on that? More yeah, importantly, sure. this new media that is emerging, I wouldn't say it's independently funded yet, but we're getting closer than we've ever been before. Um, we're not dependent on government advertising. And that's why the mainstream media are <laughs> the, the, the subservient little bitches that they are is because yeah. if the government stops spending their hundred million dollars a year that they spend, I'm talking, that's just the Victorian state government, let alone federal. Yep. If they pull their ads out of a newspaper, the newspaper folds. If they yep. pull their ads off a TV channel, the TV channel goes bankrupt. They're completely yep. subservient. We are not. 100%, over a billion dollars to the ABC every year. That's what's in the budget. You know, um, and that ABC is the left, most left wing of left wing. All of the media basically getting these subsidies by the government to talk about the Rona. You know, th this, this, this is what happened the last two years. And despite that, despite that, we have accounts that have hundreds of thousands of followers across all the the respective pages in their states and so yeah. from what i can what i can estimate the freedom community is 10 to 15 percent of each state that's yeah. amazing i mean and the last thing i'll say is we managed to not only fight the legal fees but when we needed to rock up at a place we came from around the continent and we yeah. knocked on parliament house's doors and said hey i think you're getting this wrong and i yeah. think um ben fordham who i don't usually like put it best when he said, you can't ignore that many people. And I I just want to- are trying. I just want to inject all of that hope into you guys because mm. it, it's not like we've done nothing. We mm. haven't. We have. We scared the boots off them. They ended up passing legislation to basically make it- How many, I don't know how many freedom, how many parties they got rid of, the minor parties. They got like rid of 20 to 40 minor mm. parties because of the legislation that was targeting the Liberal Democrat Party now the yeah. Lib Dems have to change their name because of it. Mm. Anyway. Well, what's interesting is, is in a way, by getting rid of a lot of those other very minor parties, they actually solved a few problems for us. Mm. Um, not, not in a huge way. Uh, you know, my, my dad ran in the lower house here in Victoria for a, a minor freedom party. And he asked me before he did it, he said, oh, should I do this? And I said, look, dad, I'm sorry. I, and I mean, no disrespect to the people in the party. They're good people. But your primary vote is going to be a rounding error. Yeah, you you know you'd be better off throwing your energy and your influence behind UAP, One Nation, Liberal Democrats. These are the three parties that actually have enough. You know, we we each of them have had elected members of parliament in the past. Uh, we're 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 on that sort of next tier up, as opposed to some of these other ones that are full of good people, but they're just not going to cut through. And yeah. so, with that change in the laws that that eliminated 20, 30, 40, however many it was of these real micro parties, in a way that actually did a favour to to the rest of us, um, you know, because we have enough members that we were able to to come over the top uh, and to meet that threshold and and to continue on.
But here's, here's the key thing, and this is what I think you're, you're sort of getting at, Joel, is this is a long-term project. You know, the, 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 the battle between those that want power and those that want freedom has been going on since long before I was born, and it will be going on long after I'm dead, right? This, there, there isn't some easy insta-win here. This was never going to be a one-and-done election. It's just not how it works. These movements take time. And I, I think we've actually built, we're close to finishing the foundation. I, I wouldn't say the foundation. Uh-oh, we've lost uh, Tofa. Oh, there oh, you are. Yeah. Yep, you're, you're back. There? there we go. Yeah, okay. I can I can hear you. Yep, you're back. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, well, well, all I was saying was I think we're close to finishing the foundation for this movement. Mm. And the foundation's the boring bit. Uh-oh, frozen again. Well, that's not good. I don't like that it's getting frozen. Um, he'll, I'm sure he'll come back in. There yep. he is. Yep, I'm back. Oh, no, what's okay. going on? I don't know. I don't they're know. Sen- they're, um, sen- they're censoring us. <laughs> no, my, my wife's probably downloading Netflix. No. Um, <laughs> so, so all I'm saying is we're close to finishing that foundation, and, and the foundation's the ugly bit. It's, you're stuck in the mud. You're digging a hole. It's you know, heavy, hard work. But it's necessary. And if you don't do that, then whatever you build on top is just going to fall apart. Mm. And all of this work that we're, that we're doing, the, the, the various freedom parties working together, various community organizations appearing and beginning to organize and coordinate. And there's various chapters, whether it's Stand in the Park, whether it's RDA, whether it's um, you know the, the Knox Freedom Family, various other groups. I'll be speaking to the Knox Freedom Family uh, on Friday of this week. Um, there are these groups that have popped up out of nowhere and this is all forming that base that foundation that we can start to build on top of and i don't think it'll happen in time for the victorian election it may not even happen in time for the new south wales election but i think by the time the next federal election rolls around we're going to be reflecting and saying okay the base is there and we're now building the structure and and that i think is when the work is going to feel less hard and the results are going to start to become more apparent yeah absolutely um i'm always comforted by the idea of traffic only moving in one direction i'm not losing viewers to the mainstream media it's just not a thing they yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the the establishment the government um all of the bureaucracy and the media they are successfully yep. pissing off every segment of society systematically <laughs> and so <laughs> far we're, so far we're already up to 10 to 15 percent in about two years mm-hmm. i mean that's pretty quick i mean if they keep this up by the time we get to the next federal election we'll have the biggest amount uh-oh <laughs> yeah, lost the ash all over the white the white hoodie. He he oh, did well. it. He did it. He did it for you guys. Like and share and subscribe, guys, for this. <laughs> that's how. You, that's how you know this isn't scripted. Um, yeah. The 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 idea that um, yeah, we, we take a lot of lessons from the Americans. They are doing a phenomenal sure. job, and I want to use this to spring to jump into your idea. I've been watching a lot about what the Daily Wire have been doing. Um, they're an organization over there, guys. You might know Ben Shapiro, who's one of the probably most well-known commentators there. Uh, Matt they just Walsh. Re- Matt Walsh. Uh, yep. They, they just recently signed on Jordan Peterson to do a bunch of segments yep. as well. They are taking their content to the absolute next level. They have over a million they, – they're approaching a million subscribers now mm-hmm. uh, that have subscribed every month making payments to to their, their service. They mm-hmm. have pledged a hundred – million dollars to Mm. making kids content so that we they can take it away those eyeballs away from disney and Mm. disney plus and they want to compete against the establishment and all this woke ideology one of the awesome things they've done is they've actually started their own razor company long story short they had a sponsor it was called harry's razors they ended up basically defunding um the the daily wire because they had the wrong opinions on uh i think it was transgenderism and then the daily Wire said you know what we've had it with you guys no worries you can go you know we, you won't be missed we're going to make our own razor company and they've already got i think hundreds of thousands of subscribers on that already and yeah. um i want to talk about exactly your idea you've mentioned uh about uh making coffee yeah yeah, so those that, are, that follow my page, you'll know I've kind of been teasing everyone with information about coffee lately, and I'm going to lay it all on the table um, on Thursday, two Thursdays time, whatever date that is, um, and, and literally do it. I'm going to do a slow chat dedicated to explaining everything about this, the reason behind it, my, the experiences that I've had that led me to conclude that this is the right way to go, uh, and, and why I think it's going to make a difference. 
I don't think we in Australia are ready for a daily wire yet. We're, we don't have enough people in the movement and our population being one thirteenth the size of the US population, the critical mass just isn't quite there. I mean, you think about it, Daily Wire has a million subscribers. That's a huge number of people, but it's actually only about a third of 1% of the US population. So you kind of, to put that in perspective. So I don't think we're ready for that model yet, but I've been very, very bothered by the fact that there are some amazing people doing amazing work. And I, I know many of them personally now, thanks to, you know, being part of the protests and everything else, um, that's, that are being hamstrung. You know, there are people that I know could be pouring a lot more time and effort into creating the content that they do, but they have to work a job because they've got bills to pay same as everybody else. Um, you know, th there are lots of things that I would like to do, but I would have to pay money out of my pocket to do them. And so I, I, I just don't, I can't. Uh, this is why I have things like merch and other things like that. Um, and so I, it was really bothering me. And I've had a few people come along talking about funding, um, you know, a new media and alternative sort of media. And, and that's, that's nice and that's good. Uh, and those conversations are ongoing. I'm having more meetings with some people about that. And, and, and that may yet lead somewhere. But I realized that what was missing, so I, I'm both a capitalist and a libertarian, right? Uh, in my opinion, you can't be, you really shouldn't be able to be one without the other, but I'll, I'll list them separately. I'm a capitalist and a libertarian. So I wanted a solution to this problem that was both capitalist and libertarian. And by libertarian, in this case, I mean decentralized. There isn't some central body controlling a pot of money, doling it out and saying, well, you can have this budget, you can have that budget. Oh, we didn't really like that. So we're going to you know, reduce your budget. We see this with places like Sky News. They come on and they say, hey, we're an alternative. We're, you know, we're an alternative to the established media. It's a matter of months before they just become a variation on the establishment media. Why? Because they've got bean counters who are worried about advertising dollars and all the same things, all those pressures that made the mainstream media what it is are experienced by any other network that tries to come in and take their place. We just don't have a, a big enough ecosystem here to sustain an alternative. So what I, the thought that I had, and this is where I've, this is where I've gone with this is, what if there was something that was in its own right, a good quality product that was already popular in Australia. Lots of people were already, you know, buying it in this case, coffee, right? The majority of Australians drink a couple of coffees a week, if not a coffee every single day, not every single person, but the majority. So coffee is already being consumed in massive numbers. What if it were possible for some young aspiring content creator, someone who really wants to make, let's say, children's entertainment, someone whose name I've never even heard of, right? You've never heard of yet. There are nobody at this moment in time. But they open up a brand new channel and they're doing, I don't know, for the sake of the argument, animations. They're doing kids' animations that have a freedom focus, a libertarian focus. They're taking the ideas of John Stuart Mill and others and putting them into fun little sh short stories that are animated for kids, right? That's a great thing. And I'd love to see that succeed. But they start to do it in their own time, the way that I started, the way that you started, the way that all of us have started. What if there was something that they could be sponsored by that actually helped them start to earn revenue as they started to get an audience? So their first video, a couple of hundred people watch it and five people go, you know what? I'd love to see more, more of that. What if there was some way that wasn't just a Patreon style support me type of link? It wasn't a charitable based thing, right? It was a capitalist based thing where there's value going both ways in the exchange. And this is where I had the idea and I've been working, I've got a business called The Cigar Professor. We import cigars into Australia. We have subscribers. We mail out packs of cigars to subscribers every three months. My business partner in that, his profession is coffee. He's actually been a coffee judge at the Australian Coffee Championships on a few occasions and he earns his living in coffee. And I thought, well, what if I use his talents and his knowledge and his connections and offer a coffee subscription service? And the idea of it is this, it becomes the thing that a freedom friendly content creator can become an affiliate for. Basically, they get, if, if someone signs up using their code, then they get 10% of, of, of every single subscription every single month. And because it's a subscription, what happens is they put out their first little animation, five people sign up and go, hey, I'll buy your coffee, I'll buy the coffee under your subscription. So you start to get some money. And they sit there and go, hey, you know what, if I got if I got five new people each episode, that would add up to something over a period of a year. And now I'm actually I'm 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 making a very small part time income after only a year of doing this. Mm. You know, I'm I'm 12 years in it was it was 11 years before I started earning any kind of income out of out of what I do, you know, and, and to make it possible if a content creator is good, 
And this is the capitalist part of it again. I'm not deciding, hey, I like your content. I'll throw some money your way. No, no, no. The people are deciding that based on whether they decide to sign up and, and, and have them as their affiliate. So the idea is basically it's a coffee subscription service. It's called Brew, uh, Brew Australia, brewaustralia.com. The website's up. We're just taking our email addresses at the moment. I've got a photo shoot and a video shoot later, uh, early next week, where we're doing all the marketing for it. Mm. Um, and the idea is basically you sign up to that and you enter into the relevant field, the content creator that you want to support. Could be Turning Point Australia could be RDA, could be Voice of Victoria, anyone that wants to sign up. And the only the only gatekeeper behavior that I have is to decide whether they're suitable or not. Does this person actually support freedom or not? Because if they don't, I'm not going to allow them to become an affiliate. But if they do, there's no further looking into, do I like what they're doing? Do I like their style? Are they a bit too conspiratorial? No, 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 none of that. We're not canceling people, right? That's up to you to decide which person you want to be supporting. So that's the idea. And, and my hope would be that over the period of the next two to three years, we can grow this to the point that there's actually a viable career pathway. People shy away from this. Oh, no, it shouldn't be about the money. Well, I'm sorry. My landlord, it's about the money. My grocery store, it's about the money. When I want to fill up, when I want to put a tank of petrol in my car, it's about the money. So I'm sorry. There is a degree to which it is about the money. So what if we could give these talented up-and-comers a viable, realistic pathway to actually be able to pay their bills, creating freedom-friendly content. Mm. We're not ready for a daily wire yet, but I think we're ready for something like this. I think this could really work. So this has become, I've now been working on it for over six months, quietly in the background. I began to tease people with it about a month ago to say that it was coming. Uh, and in about two weeks, you're going to see us releasing a lot more information or in two Thursdays time, I'm doing a slow chat, just laying out the entire philosophy behind it, exactly what it is. Um, and giving people the opportunity to become. So I need 250 people basically to become foundation members that then make it possible for the business just to function as a business. And then everyone after that point gets to select a content creator that they want to support. Uh, mm. And then it starts to go out and, and it's not just supporting me. Obviously, that first 250 is effectively supporting me. Right? That's what that's about. It's to actually allow me to operate the business and make a little bit of money out of that. Then after that, every single person gets to, to pick. Who do, who do you want to support? And if I don't have an affiliate link with the person that you want to support, tell me who it is and I'll reach out to them and I'll have a look. And if they're freedom friendly, we'll add them. Yeah. And, and you can literally go out there and just say, hey, there's this young kid that started doing this thing. I really like their style. Can I please support them through this? Yeah. Um, and, and it just becomes this, it's not centrally controlled. It's libertarian in that sense. It's capitalist in the sense that there is, there is a trade going on. You know, you're buying coffee. Um, but it's also capitalist in the sense that you are supporting the people that you want to support. It's not me that's making that decision. So that's where I'm going. I think it has the potential to completely change the media landscape in Australia forever. I think it has the potential to completely rewrite the rules around uh, freedom-friendly content in Australia, and that's what I hope to do. Yeah, and it also sounds like you can't. It can't be. Um, uh, it doesn't sound political either. It doesn't sound like it's, it, it'd end up picking a, a political party as a political it's, donation. If you support um, freedom in principle, uh, you know, uh, as as a matter of principle, right, then right. then you can you can partner with us. Right. Um, yeah. Look, I can't wait to see. So that's in a couple of weeks. Uh, you're gonna yeah. Look, do the, the, the website Brew Australia is already up. We've already got a, an Instagram page and a Facebook page. Not that there's many people there because not a lot of people know about it yet. But yes, in the coming weeks is when when there's going to be a lot more information being released about it. Awesome. Well, we'll have to keep we'll have to keep an eye out to see how that goes. I um one of the biggest problems I I saw over the last couple of years is the fact that uh you know you get a Simon Holmes a court coming in with twenty million dollars yeah. running in running in twenty seats a million dollars a seat and yeah. uh, and being able to do a very targeted campaign on and actually being very successful mm -hmm. um, and then you've got you know some people that put hundreds of millions of dollars into the campaign <laughs> and successfully managed to ruin the word freedom um, mm -hmm. because of bad advertising. I, um, I, 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 I think I think that, um, yeah, to pretend that money is not important, it's, it, it, it's laughable. We are up against some of the most well-funded campaigns mm -hmm. in history and um, in Australian history. And when it comes to, you know... Uh, the ideas I try to usually put forward, I try to make them as efficiently spending as possible. I mean, for the sure. for example, the election, we ended mm. up um, having, and I say this from my from my own viewers who really helped 
uh, spread the how to vote cards. This is your success because you made it work. It was a yeah. great idea, the how to vote cards. Um, we put our heart and soul into it to make sure you had the best information. And we ended up yeah. having over 250,000 downloads of the yeah, actual wow. how to vote card. So that's, uh, that's lower amazing. house, lower house and upper house is one how to vote card. That's excellent guys. Wow. Well done. That was you. That's, yeah. that's on you. It wasn't, it wasn't just me. I mean, sure. I have a team who actually put the thought into it and then I just did my videos and got it out to you in terms of the budget that we had for that last I checked, it was only $5,000 in terms of the budget. Now, yeah, that's you, now you guys do the maths. Mm. If if it's true that we ended up actually defunding that, two hundred and fifty thousand people took those cards to the ballot box. Maybe mm. a few of them shared a screenshot of it around, which we can't track. That's sure. that's um that's five hundred thousand people going out there, both for the lower house and for the upper house. So two hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. times times two, and you times yep. that by two dollars ninety. Yeah. We're, look, we're looking at possibly, possibly, and I don't know, guys, I have no idea, possibly defunding the major parties by $1.45 million. Now, yeah. that's not a bad investment for 5K, uh, if I may say so myself. Yeah. But, um, but the, the, I, I'm not very apologetic when it comes to asking for money because my audience knows if I'm spending the money, it's going to be a quality thing. It's going to be really efficiently done. And um, I think people, if they saw what you did on the Battleground Melbourne uh, documentary. It was really well done. Yeah, thank you. And but but here's here's the thing. It's not it's not just about people like you and I. You and I have already kind of crossed that first hurdle, where yeah. we do have people that know about us and are yeah, willing yeah. to reach into their pockets purely on ideological grounds to say, mm. "I like what you're doing. I'm going to support it." We're missing a lot of talent. Yeah, that never makes it to the point where you or I even hear of them. Yeah, and yeah. they could be ten times more talented than you or I. Mm. They just don't have the mechanism. They just they're not able to get noticed. Yeah, absolutely. And they look ahead at what this life means for them and they go, Well, this is just gonna suck. And I'm gonna be broke and I'm never gonna be able to get married and, and have kids and and you know buy a house and all these things if I go down this path. And so they choose a different path. And what I really want to do is to to change the way this career choice. I mean, it's not a career, it's a, it, it is a passion, it has to be. Mm. Um but to change the way this looks financially so that people can say, hey, actually, I've got a passion to create this content. And if that content actually does resonate with people, there's a way that I could pay bills and yeah. I could hire a team and I could actually buy a house yeah, you know, and get absolutely. married and have kids. And there's actually a way to, you know, there is a way to do it in America. There isn't here yet. And yeah. that's what I'm hoping. This becomes the first stepping stone. And in time, we'll branch out of coffee. I mean, people are spending money all the time on all sorts of different things. What if we could offer them the opportunity to buy really good quality stuff that actually saves them money? Because this coffee is cheaper than the coffee you're buying at the moment, right? It's it's really good quality. It's specialty grade organic coffee. It's a subscription. It shows up to your door every single month ready for you to make. It's the easiest coffee you've ever made. It tastes fantastic. It's going to save you money compared to buying at a cafe. In fact, it's less than half the cost. And it's supporting the, the freedom-friendly media landscape. So what if we then branched out into other things, other, other forms of, you know, whether it was um, supplements or whether it was, you know, milk, you know, milkman showing up at your door every day with fresh milk, like who knows where it could go. But mm. we're all spending money all the time. What if we could shift that spending instead of it being extra money out of your pocket, right? Which everyone only has so much of that, right? Yep. What if it was the money that you're already spending, but now it's cheaper on a better quality product that's supporting freedom-friendly media. What if we yeah. could achieve that? And that's what I'm aiming for with this. Yeah, I, I'm definitely very worried about um, having made it through the door like yourself. Mm. On um, and it's not just it's not just the funding, guys. It's the censorship. You know, I mm. I feel like I've been around long enough to get people's emails and be like, okay, no worries, we're off. If everything got nuked, I've got their I've got their emails. Yeah. A lot of people they they can't never even. Get there. They never get there. You know, the one, yep. one word, it takes one word and, it, you know, mm -hmm. that's it. You're mm -hmm. censored forever on mm -hmm. mainstream social media and mm -hmm. you can't get a following to generate, you know, interest, likes, views. So they make Correct. you think that your content's crap. Um, now, look, I can't wait to hear the full proposal on this. And um, I think there's yep. absolute potential. And I think it's ludicrous to think that we can't start. We need to start producing our own things. We have to. Yep. I mean, whether it's, you know, the, the greater debate about manufacturing in Australia, or whether sure. it's having more conservatives actually step up and mm. um, and start making things like our own social media platforms like we saw in America. Mm. But um, America, as usual, leading the way. We've got a long <laughs> way to go. Um, one of the really cool things, I, I can't wait to share with you, Tofa, and um, 
you guys are hearing this live. I have not told Topher about this at all. Um, Topher, you know that Nigel Farage is coming to tour at the end of September. I, I do. would I would love to uh, have you on the dinner table with Nigel for a special dinner uh, backstage um, on the actual uh, Victorian show on the 26th. This, this is my happy dance. This is my <laughs> happy, happy dance. dance. I, 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 think you'd, um, I think you'd love to, to meet the guy. He's an absolutely charismatic bloke, um, Nigel. And yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'd love, love to see you there. I think it'd be awesome, guys. And um, yeah. the Victorian show's on the 26th. Sydney's on the 27th of September and uh, Brisbane's on the 30th, I do believe, uh, yeah. of September. So that's going to be really good. And um, yeah, it'd be great right. to have you there. I think, I think you know, p- people, people, this is someone that's been against the establishment in the UK and managed to prevail uh, to a large extent. Uh, what, yeah. what he's accomplished is astonishing. His resilience in spite of all the haters and the people that have tried to drag him down is just deeply impressed just at a personal level. I mean, you, you, you've experienced the same thing, Joel, uh, the level of personal hatred that you cop doing what we do. And, and he stood tall through all of that. Uh, he's a man that I, I have some disagreements with. I'm not a conservative myself. Uh, so politically speaking, I have some disagreements with, but I have absolute admiration for what he's accomplished and the mm. way that he has stood firm uh, is is just deeply impressive to me. Um, he and I actually did briefly have some communications many years ago when I worked with Lord Christopher Monckton on the 50 to 1 project, mm. um, but I've never met him and never had the chance to actually have a, anything resembling a decent conversation with him. So I, I accept your invitation. Uh, I'm thrilled to have been invited and I feel very, very honored. Thank you. That's that's really awesome. I'm I'm actually um I've just got word literally over text. Sorry, I'm so rude, guys. I've actually just got word. I'm I'll be interviewing him this week. Um, I can't. I, Fantastic. I, I'm I'm totally going to nerd out on this guy. Like, I <laughs> you, you said you 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 flatter me. You flat. No, honestly, man. Like, I have been following this guy. Like, I was on construction sites laying bricks. I was I was yep. doing the hard work. I was landscaping and listening yep. to LBC radio. I can still recall the actual advertisements they were playing during the actual the breaks when he was on LBC radio uh, and I I I got a front row seat just to see the whole of Brexit and learn all of these lessons but a lot of people are like Joel how do you know so much about Australian politics yeah, yeah. as yeah. just like you it's overseas it's overseas it's overseas America you know the UK things are a lot more fast paced I am flattered that you think I've copped as much flack as Nigel no <laughs> bloody way. I, you know, sure, I've had my legal fees and the police have come after me and I get, you know, the, the yeah. shill watchers out there. No. Oh, yeah. I, uh, Nigel has absolutely co- – no one has copped it like him in the UK. It's been insane. The fact that the man's not a knight blows my mind. <laughs> um, he, he is the he Nigel – absolutely. And he's the Nigel – he's the, the Donald Trump of the UK, except the way their political system set up, he can't get into the major party and run yeah. as the president or you know or, or, or the prime minister. You got to you got to yeah. be in there and work through the system. You got to schmooze the same as Australia. You've uh, got to schmooze your way up that pole. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and the reason the reason why I bring up um, this this tour, guys. And by the way, if you want tickets, nigellive.com.au, um, mm. is the fact that Nigel is actually a um, a person that is. Um, is help. He actually introduced us with Turning Point. He was actually the one that um, introduced us to uh, the people over in America, and he was the one that actually ended up saying these are the guys that can run Turning Point Australia. And so a lot of people yeah. don't know that. He's an absolute, absolute legend. And going back to the reason why I brought this up, these tours are really going to help um, fund everything we're doing. So the, mm. the September actual uh, events that we're holding, three shows – they're going to really help fund what we're going to be doing in Victoria, what we're going to be doing in New South Wales, all of our other content and our animation series, and to bring more staff yeah. on. And so we've, as you can probably tell from my conversation with Tofa, a lot of people, they're trying to start up. I think Voice for Victoria, they're starting proper subscription um, yeah, service true. as well. And I wish her the best of luck with that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, we're mm-hmm. all trying to work out, okay, We've established a presence. We've established value. How can we keep this going in a way that works for everyone? So um, it's going to be an interesting, you know, few years. But there's one thing I can see: none of us are going away. You know, we're we're not going to let some. Uh, I better not quote M on this, but we're not going to let you know some idiots basically push us around and chase us out of our state. And I'm, I was going to quote her from your from your documentary. Yeah, from you know Graham the line. Melbourne. And yes, so. I do. I, I just, I, I just, I just can't wait to be down there in Melbourne with you. 
um, and and watching that live with everyone, I think it's going to be quite the experience being in the theater. Yeah. And um, and yeah, but um, believe it or not, Tofa, we've talked for an hour fourteen minutes, and it feels mm. like the time just goes with us. It, um, yeah, yeah. It, it was. It's been an absolute pleasure. Have you seen the Nigel? Uh, cl- the Nigel, uh, sorry, trailer that that we played. No, I haven't. That's I've, that's that's passed me by somehow. Oh well, well, you know, you, just for the sake of it, guys, and any excuse yep. to play it, I think play I, it. I think play I might it. play it right now. Here we go. Yeah, I haven't seen it. All right. You have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. Virtually none of you have ever done a proper job in your life. Just who the hell do you think you people are? Who are you? Who voted for you? Big government. I can't stand it. They came to bar me uh, from actually physically entering this hotel. So that's not very nice, uh, but it's not going to stop me. We don't know you. We don't want you. You have no legitimacy in this job at all. This is the world's greatest leader. All I need is the right beer named after me. That's all we need. You know, when I came here 17 years ago and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. You're not laughing now, are you? Anyway, um, that is who you will be seeing in in Melbourne. I can't wait. (laughs) Quits a smile on my face. I tell you what, (laughs) quits a smile on my face. Listen, can I I just say something? Um, Yeah, mate. I, I have some inkling of the amount of risk that Joel has had to take to put this tour on. Uh, there are all the costs around the events and and the the actual locations where he's going. There's going to be costs around you know Nigel etc. He obviously he's got bills to pay as well, um, so he can't net fly it around halfway around the world and and you know get nothing. Um, you know, you need to tell Joel that he's on the right track, and you need to do it by booking tickets, so that this becomes a financial success because you know that he's going to roll that money back into doing more good work right? This is the thing. People can say nice things about you, but people can lie with their words. People don't lie with their money. People tell the truth with their money. If you actually want to support Joel and you want to see more of this sort of stuff happening in Australia, then you need to book your tickets. Number one, you'll be glad you were there. I look forward to seeing you there if you're there in Melbourne. Uh, And number two, it's telling Joel, hey, this is a good thing. I'll take a risk again. I'll do this again. I'll bring out more amazing speakers. I'll put on more amazing events. I'll keep bringing this community together. If he doesn't sell tickets, what does that tell him? Yeah. You figure it out. Um, buy tickets, guys. Get there. You will not regret it. Absolutely. And look, uh, a lot of people are sort of taking my word for it, that Nigel's an amazing guy. There's so many videos out there to see about him. But we, the best is actually yet to come. The future guests we have planned for Turning Point, they're either mm. on par or better. And they're from mm. America, just to allude to it. We know exactly okay. who they are. I just got to keep my lips sealed. And this is the start of something, if you guys like it. If you don't want it, you know, we, we can just be stuck with our, you know, our classic Australian politicians. But there's something <laughs> invigorating about seeing overseas politicians come to Australia and be like, yeah, you know what? We kicked ass in our own countries. And I want to encourage you guys in Australia to do the same. We, we do want to do, um, this is the first of, very, of a lot more tours. We wanted to mm-hmm. prioritize Victoria. That's why you're the first cab off the rank on, uh, the 20, on the 26th, because of your state election especially. And then we've also got Sydney uh, in New South Wales being the, um, the, the next one after that because of our state election in March. And then there's Queensland, which just sort of worked with numbers and, and the East yeah. Coast. But for yeah. future um, uh, tours, we will definitely be doing the other states. This isn't Turning Point East Coast. This isn't Turning Point New South Wales, Melbourne. This is a Turning Point Australia. And if you guys are able to make it even from the other states, we'd love to have you. This is, the, as Donald Trump would say, the best is yet to come. We've got plenty of things lined up. And um, yeah, no, thank you so much for that plug. I, I, if you guys want if you guys want tickets, absolutely. Please remember to go book at uh, nigellive.com.au. Uh, and yep. um, yeah, I... I I just want to thank you for coming on and uh, and and sharing mate. sharing the time with me, mate. Mate, it's, it's my pleasure, and it's it's always a lot of fun. The time does pass very very quickly. Uh, I'm going to give myself one last plug shamelessly yeah. before we finish, and that is tofafield.net. Join the mailing list, as the graphic says, but also the very top blog post that's pasted there has the dates and the booking links for all of the Battleground Melbourne Cinema showings. 
Now, Battleground Melbourne, just to be very clear, it's available for you to watch for free at battlegroundmelbourne.com. Okay, you don't have to pay to see it. It's free to watch. It was crowdfunded and it will always be free to watch. But if you want to be in that room, especially the premiere at Rivoli Cinemas in Camberwell on the 23rd of August, that's going to be a phenomenal room to be in. There's only about 100 tickets left. We've sold about 400-ish of them. Um, there's about 100 tickets left. Uh, and then there's tickets left at the other showings that you'll find there as well. But some of them are getting close to, to selling out. So if you want to be there, like I said at, at the start, you know, you send a link to Battleground Melbourne to someone, they probably won't watch it. You go over to their house with a DVD, they might watch it. You book them a ticket at the cinemas and you tell them they're coming to the cinemas with you. Well, then they're kind of obliged, aren't they? They kind of have to do it at that point, right? And so that's what this cinema tour is about. It's about not just... Obviously, you know, those who already know about it, those who have seen it coming together with each other in one room and having that experience, because I think that's going to be really powerful. And I think it's going to be really healing for a lot of us. But it's also about bringing in those other people and saying, hey, sit down, watch this. It'll change your life. It'll change how you view what's happened in Victoria over the last couple of years. That's what it's for. So tofafield.net, the very first blog post, it's pinned to the top of the page. You find all the links there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Topher. Guys, if you enjoyed this conversation, remember to like, comment, give it a share, and um, be sure to uh, support this guy and all the stuff that he's doing in Victoria. Topher, mate, it's been a pleasure. Joel, it always is. I look forward to next time. I can't wait to see you in person soon. <laughs> Yay, finally. <laughs> finally. All right, see you guys.